Um, so I'm Ross Barker, uh, I work at International College Hong Kong, which funnily enough is a school that Brian's kids attend, way up that way near the border. Um, and what I'll share with you today is a, an open school, open source school platform that we've been developing in our school for the last five years. Um, it's a one-stop shop for uh, teachers' needs with the aim that teachers know exactly where to go to get information and it serves the same function for students and parents. Um, so here you can see the homepage and I can log in with my username and password um, or if you're a Google school and people have Google accounts you should just be able to sign up with Google. So we do that. So I'm running this off my phone Wi-Fi so we'll see what the performance is like. With local Wi-Fi it's pretty quick but that seems to be so the aim with the Google sign-in is it's just one less password to remember um, and it also does some integration with calendars and things like that. When it works, there we go. Okay. So one of the design aims we've given right from the beginning is to try and have all of the information that you need as a teacher ready for you um, when you log in. So I was out of school today but I did prepare three lessons that were taught for me by cover teachers. So those three lessons that I've previously planned appear there and I can go into those lessons and see what my students were doing. So for example, my year seven students, um, I set them a range of topics that they can look into, which will load up in just a second. And I said, choose one of these topics and, and try and do as much independent learning as you can in my absence. What the students did as they worked is that they asked me certain questions through this lesson interface when it loads up and I was able to respond from my meeting and stay in touch with the lesson and what was happening. Here we go, so here are the students, lovely kids that they are, and here is the work that I set them. Right. Scrolling down, you can see some of the interactions that I had with those students throughout that lesson. Again, from my home page. So the other thing you'll see when we come back to the home page is that below that I can see my timetable which is currently loading up and my timetable is laid over with my Google Calendar in blue and the school's Google Calendar in green. So in one place I can see my own schedule, other things I've added on an ad hoc basis and what's been added in for me by the school. Uh, if I was a form tutor, I would see my tutees down in this area, I'd see a grid of happy smiling student faces um, and from that I could quickly see any alerts for different students in terms of behaviour and academic progress and I can click on their links and go to their data from there. Um, up here on the right hand side we have the message wall so this highlights three of today's messages of which there are in total four I can see up here and these will just scroll through so we use this like as a targeted bulletin board um, as you can see, our head of house has been particularly active with his messages. Further down, I see a summary of my upcoming deadlines that I've assigned to students so I can keep a track of incoming work. Um, the red here indicates that there is less than 20, uh, 48 hours to go on the deadline and the students see a similar view so they get a prompt to remind them uh, of, of their priorities. If I was to click on this, it will take me back to that lesson plan view that we saw earlier um, and in this lesson I've set it up to accept homework so you'll see a list of submitted homework from students and I can see here with 48 hours to go who has submitted and who has yet to submit. So as per usual we expect a last minute rush of homework. Um, what I found with the system though with the students having access to those that deadline information is that actually homework submission has gotten better. So before where I might have had say a quarter of the class late, that's usually down now to just one or two students. Uh, and then I'm able to follow up with them and get submission. The advantage here is that I'm not having students email me work and I'm not having to organize it and deal with emails and mark it <coughs> and, late and file it and rename it. It's all there, time stacked, and I can go in and view the work right there. The farm has been automatically renamed, I guess? Or? Yes, yeah. With a, uh, with a random string on the end so that students can't guess each other's names. Not that any of my students ever tried to do that, but just in case. 
Right, so from here I'm just going to go back to the home page. Just let that load up. And then further down below the homework and deadlines we see a listing of all of my classes. And for each of those I can view lesson plans, I can assess work in the mark book, I can see who's in the class, um, and I can look at their upcoming deadlines. If I click on the name of the class it will take me to a summary overview page where I can access more information on that class. So again the aim is to bring together all of that information that I need and make it quickly available so I'm not heading off into different places. Students see a very similar view to this. Um, obviously it's customizable by school. You might want to share more or less information. And parents have a view that includes um, the, the lessons of the day for their children. So they'll see a block, a dashboard for each um, child. And I can actually show you that. I'm the pretend father to a child who belongs to one of my colleagues. So here we go. Here is my parent view of my adopted son. So I see there his classes, his recent grades, and his upcoming deadlines. And under the top here, I can browse to his timetable, his after school activities, free learning work that he's been doing, and some extra assessment data that we have in that school. So again, for parents, when they come in, no need to hunt down different things. That essential information is all there on the homepage. Um, that feature that you saw down here, the role switcher, this means if I have multiple roles in the school, I don't need to have multiple accounts. I just press the button and it changes my interface accordingly. So I'll go back to my administrator role there. One of the other main uh, design themes of the software is to try and gather what is often very diverse and dispersed data about students and to bring it together into a single student profile. So if I show you my staff view of the same student, right, when, I, when I search up here I actually see the father because he's one of my colleagues and I can view his profile, find his email address, get his phone number, uh, look at his timetable, things like that. But I can do the same with the student. So when this loads up I'll see uh, a basic summary of his data, how old he is, um, his name, things like that, his picture, any medical conditions, his teachers, so I can quickly copy and paste those into an email, which is great, we no longer get emails to the teacher of Joe, personalized emails, and below that I can see his timetable so I can quickly track him down in school. Um, the, these lessons with the magnifying glass, uh, with the plus, those are lessons that have lesson plans associated with them, created by my colleagues, and I can go in and see what he's been studying today, um, if I want to really find out what's going on for him. On the right-hand side over here, I see a menu of all of the various data about Joe that has been collected by different parts of the system. So, some personal overview data, assessment data, learning related data, and then pastoral data down here, I think. Yeah, that's the lot. So again, when I started at my school, we had a lot of spreadsheets. All of this information was on individual people's computers or shared in multiple formats, and there was no way to see it all together. But what we're trying to do is just create this um, more efficient usage of data so the teachers are really informed about the kids that they're working with. Uh, we can see up here Joe has a moderate medical alert, the M standing for medical, the orange on the scale, grey, orange, red. He might also have another four warnings up there, so there may be individual needs, privacy, behaviour and academic, and those are generated depending on various data within the system. Um, and that's that's it in terms of the aims of the system. Along the top menu, you'll see a range of different modules with different purposes. So for example, the mark book assessment lets teachers record their uh, ongoing classroom assessments. Um, I can go through this menu with you. The, the core given setup comes with about 20 different modules. Uh, so if you want me to go through them in detail, it usually takes about an hour to cover the ins and outs, or if you want to ask targeted questions, um, I can show you specific features. Up to you. I saw under others there's finances. Yep. What's that? Uh, so, 
Finance has two main uh, areas of functionality at current. The first one is uh, managing outgoing invoices, so generating billing for students. Um, actually, we use this at our primary campus, but not at the secondary campus, and um, it, it makes a big difference in terms of streamlining. So at the secondary, we have a separate billing system, and we have to spend quite a lot of effort to keep the data synchronized between the two systems. So for example, if a parent updates their personal information here, it then has to be manually transferred to the other system. The advantage gained by the primary school is that they can generate the invoices and send them out from this system and then track payment all within the one place. Um, the other functionality is managing expenses. And I think this is new from my last visit, I have a feeling. Um, you can uh, create budget areas and budget approvers and then teachers with access to certain budgets can request expenses which can then go up a chain of approval and deliver it gets to the head of school or the board of directors, whoever. And then when it's approved, the teacher or the finance department or your, your requisitions officer receive an alert telling them that they can go ahead and purchase that item. So again, just trying to uh, use data and use the system's knowledge of who is who to, to uh, sort of smooth over a variety of workflows. So does all your reporting take place through this platform? Yep. Yeah. So we do reporting in a number of different ways, all under the assessment area. Um, so I'll just try and give the whole, not just academic reports, but the whole. Um, ARR reporting and recording uh, sense. So when the students apply to us, they do a CAT test, which is our standardized entrance test. That gets stored in the formal assessment section. And assuming they get admitted, that then becomes like a baseline uh, grade that teachers can use to inform their assessment. So that entry grade appears in the mark book. So the English grade would appear to the English teacher in the mark book helping them set some expectations for, for that student's development. The teacher, as they progress, will keep their own assessment data in the mark book. So in the mark book, you can create a column, um, and in that column, you could store, say, assessment and, uh, sorry, attainment and a comment, or effort and a comment, there's different combinations, and record your class's progress over time. Um, we have a requirement to do one formative assessment a term, which is the CFA column up at the top. So that is set up centrally by our um, head of assessment. It's pushed out to all the teachers, and then we get a, an email telling us you need to fill in this column at this time. So we go ahead and do that. And then once a year, we write a formal summative report that goes out to parents as PDFs. And that's configurable in various ways. A really technical question, but in terms of uh, universities, because that's the bit that I work with, do you sure. know if your university guys have a way to feed report grades through to generate transcripts? Okay, um, yes, the reporting module does generate a transcript. It can do um, an end of year grade summary, or it can do a transcript of every year and every course studied throughout. Um, that module doesn't come included in the system, so most of the system uh, is, is most of the functionality is in the core of the system, but some modules are additional and plug in. Um, almost all of those are free. The reporting module was created by a commercial company, and there's a free version, and then there's a paid version that they'll customize uh, to meet your requirements. So it just, just depends on how you want to set that up. Um, under other, there's an additional module. This is one of the free open source modules called Higher Education. And this does uh, two things for us. One, it lets the students um, say where they plan on applying and track their application process, a bit like Naviance, mm -hmm. I don't believe. Yeah. Um, I don't believe it goes into as much depth as Naviance, but it's free. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and, it, and it meets the needs of, of our school, at least. So the students are going in and saying, this is where I'm applying, this is my high reach, this is my reach, this is my safety. Um, and then they're planning their, their personal uh, question responses and updating that. So instead of having to, say, email out or locate the students, the uh, university coordinator can just browse that data there. And then the second part of that is a reference writer. So the students can go in and request a reference 
and then the, um, the higher education coordinator approves that reference, it gets sent out to the relevant teachers who fill in their parts and then the system pulls mm -hmm. it back in when it's ready. And that's free, that's open source? Yeah, yeah that's all included. Um, so yeah, again, you know, there are so many variations in schools, there are so many different ways of doing things, but there are a lot of things that we do in common, so we've tried to build in those common functions that are, that are performed in all schools, right? Certainly all schools with, with secondary leaders. Yep. Uh, I have more of a general question, but this is, seems to deal with a lot, a lot of things, which is good. Uh, what was your purpose behind this, uh, um, rather than purchasing an existing software? Because there are many on the market. Yep. Not free, of course, and yep. not open source. Yep. Uh, a few of them. Um, so what was the target behind, behind development? Maybe this is a lot of work, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess I could say world domination, uh, but it's nothing, <laughs> it's nothing that grand. Um, I've, I had previously run my own IT company and I All used right. open source um, solutions a lot. Yeah. Um, and my background is, is in open source. Um, I also wrote the precursor to the software for Chartin College, who needed some specific functionality. Um, and I ended up as a copyright holder. That. So when I started at my school, as I said, we had very few systems, everything was very disorganized. I knew I didn't want a commercial system, I wanted to be able to build new functionality and, and tailor it to our school. Um, so I looked at the, the state of open source systems, uh, and they, there just weren't any that were really mature enough or moving in the right direction. So I took that core that I already had, and I open sourced it, and then I... Um, I, I reprogrammed it to make it more flexible to suit more schools because it was very much focused for Chartier College and then just started incrementally building in the different functionality that you see. And how, how did it at that time, maybe it's different now, but because I know ESF has a, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, has a centralized system as well. So how does it, does it plug in? Is there some kind of Okay. The data yep. interaction with the centralized system? Or? So the, the precursor system, which was called Muse, um, read data out of Maze, which is the ESF centralized yes. system. Okay. Um, and it did that with just some standardized routines for importing from CSV. Right. Those same routines appear in this system pretty much as they are. So you can bulk import students and staff and parents and families and courses and classes and things like that. Yeah. Um, it's not specific to the ESF system, um, with some data massage you should be able to get data from one system into the import format and then draw it in. Yeah. And that can be done as a one-off or um, on, a regular, you know, on a regular basis using a batch process. At my school that's uh, not really an issue because this is our primary repository of information and you know, the, the organisational benefits of having everything together, everything in one place are quite profound. Um, one of the things that the system does is admissions. So under people, you'll see application form. This is also available on uh, the public interface. So we actually have saved a lot of data input work by having the parents do the data input. And then yes. when we're ready to accept an application, we just press the accept button. It sets up the accounts on here. It emails our technical staff and says, this student is expected. Please set up this email address and this website and prepare their credentials and that is then ready to go out. So it really streams, streamlines those admission processes for us. When, when you say public interface, you, you also have a separate school website, is that yes. right? Yeah. yeah. So a link to that one there. Yeah, so the school website has a, yep, so there's a link up at the top. Yes. So there's a few different links, it's very well spotted, so I can jump to my email to the school website or to my own website, because at school we each have a, a WordPress powered site. Um, the school website has like the, the public facing brochure type information, and when you go to the admissions section and you click on the apply button, it then takes you to this system. Good questions. What's under the people tab? What, what do you see under students? Perhaps when you click on a people tab. Yep, so people, <coughs> students, what I see is a directory of all students. All students, yeah. And I can click on them to then view the profile information that you saw previously. 
presumably then message students or or the staff or parents. Yep. Most of our so when when we're emailing individuals, we go through Gmail, which is our primary interface. Yeah. But if we want to do bulk emailing, we can use the Messenger. Uh, okay. So if I show you the view, if I'm if I just want to be quick, I can just put a message on the wall, which is the bit that you saw up here, and in this area of the homepage. Um, that has limited options. It's a very quick way to do it. If I want to have more options, I can choose here to have messages delivered by, let me just turn that off, by email, on the message wall, or by SMS. Although there's a cost associated with the SMS, you have to buy credits. Um, just like a regular email, I give it a subject and a body. And again, this is the power of having your data in one place. I can now choose to target different people according to their role in the system, the courses, classes, activities that they do because the system has so much information it can find those people for me. So I might say, for example, please send this message to everyone in my Term 1 to Term 3 ICT extension, and I don't want to include parents, but I do want to include the staff and students involved in that, and then my message will be sent out. And that saves on the IT administration side having multiple lists for different things. So we have now one one mailing group for each form group, just for convenience, for sharing documents and things like that. And then we have the staff list and things like that. But we don't maintain parent lists or activity lists or uh, lesson lists or anything like that. It's all, all in one place. Do your staff have Macs? Yes. Yeah. Um, obviously the mobile mobility of the technology now makes it easier for them to use this system rather than having to go into a fixed computer all the time, yeah? Yeah, uh, so the, the school's quite young, so we don't have a lot of, of legacy technology, so I think that was quite an easy decision to make. When the school started, there were um, you know 15 classrooms but 10 teachers, so right. it's easier to put a laptop in everyone's hand than to spread desktops around. Yeah. So yeah, but that works very well for us. Um, what Gibbon doesn't do at the moment is it doesn't have a, a responsive theme, like a mobile responsive theme. So if I shrink down the screen, the elements don't all resize and rearrange. Okay. So you can use it on a phone, but you have to pinch and zoom. Yeah. You can use it quite comfortably on a, on a regular sized iPad. But we, as a school, you know, we're, we're very Mac oriented. We don't do a lot of mobile stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I do know um, one new school is, is, has just decided to use Gibbon and they have a developer there who's very interested in producing a responsive theme. So you know, possibly within the next six months there'll be something in that area. And that's really the exciting thing about open source. As more schools get involved, what you're getting really is a community, not a product. We get the product too. Um, but you, you get a community of educators who are, who are interested in, in pushing this technology to do different things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's evolved much faster than you might expect a commercial product to, even though we're, we're under-resourced in comparison. Which is so do others suggest to you what feature, new feature they would like and then you develop, or is that um, what works, or do they get the permissions to do the development themselves? So, open source work? so with it being open source, um, there's, a, there's a public repository of all the code, yeah. um, and you can join the team with a variety of privileges. Okay. Some people will take my code base, make their own copy, make changes, and then ask if they can push them back. Okay. And I'll check the quality, and if, it, if they're doing good things with the system, I'll load those changes in. Um, we also have a development roadmap, um, so we're trying to always look 12 months in advance. So uh, in December, we released version 11. In June, we will release version 12. Okay. Um, and if you look at the roadmap, it just outlines the next two versions. Yeah. Um, and you can see the, the code in development. So as I make changes, I push it out so you can see what's coming up and you can see the feature list. Okay. And I manage the feature list based on that forum. If someone has a suggestion for a feature, we try and schedule it up. Um, and we look to sort of take 40 to 50 suggested features in every version to build in. Um, in April, we're having our first 
hackathon, which will be <laughs> hopefully about 10 coders getting together for the day um, and just working to, to try and push out as many of those features as we can. So that's the sort of more exciting part of things starting to grow. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, student has like, an express interest in joining yeah. the... Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'll probably have uh, three or four students there. In fact, Cool. Um, if you look at, and, and this, this is a great thing I think we were talking about last time I was here, if you look at the credits down here, you'll see a number of students mentioned by name. Some of them contributed ideas, but a few of them actually coded in specific improvements. Um, particularly this help desk module, which is one of the free additional modules. This was built by a student um, as part of his, uh, what we call enrichment and flow, like personal study time in school. So he built that over six months and went through a real development cycle of uh, coding, bug testing, improving, constant releases, and he's got his own GitHub repository, so he's, he's sort of taken that to quite a high level. Nice. Um, so we're starting to, to encourage teachers, instead of emailing myself or the technician, to put their problems in the help desk, and then we try and get back to them accordingly. Um, how much dependency on other, in the core? Uh, yeah. <coughs> dependencies on uh, other technologies like uh, because I see you have a calendar is it yep. a straight from Google Calendar or is it an, an open source another open source uh, library or so if, yeah the timetable rendering um, so the columns the design of the timetable and these elements are all native to Gibbon right. so if Google goes down you still have your timetable what comes live from Google is the overlay. So if for some reason your Google connection doesn't work, then you don't get the calendar overlay, but you still get your own timetable. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there are no live dependencies <coughs> on other, say, cloud services or technologies, but if you look at the code base, um, you'll see in the library section a large <coughs> range of libraries that have been used mm -hmm. to build in certain features. So for example, payments go through PayPal, oh, actually that is one example, right? okay. payments do go through PayPal. Um, but a lot of these like Excel building yeah. tools, PDF building tools, light boxes, things like that, um, they're static offline built in. And yes, we update them from time to time, but within your version, you're guaranteed that, that stability. <coughs> Last time, Ross, you, you spoke about uh, having to spend an inordinate amount of time sealing up some, some back door and security issues. Yes. Yep. Anything else cropped up or are you feeling pretty secure? <laughs> I try never to feel secure. <laughs> um, but ins insecure is more secure. Um, so the, the story I told last time was um, that a, a programmer that I didn't know that was introduced to me looked at the code and picked out of uh, a, quite a serious vulnerability that I thought I'd mitigated in one way, but he had some additional experiences and he was able to to show some theoretical holes. So I spent about two or three hundred hours um, migrating from one particular style of database connection to another that gave much more robust SQL injection protection. Um, so you know we do take we do take security really seriously. Um, as always, security is a process. So the, the security of the code is important, but so is the security of your servers and your server room and your staff and their passwords and their machines. But we do as much as we can to, to always respond to security threats. Um, and I have a couple very bright students who are constantly trying to find flaws. And they found a couple minor flaws, more annoyances than exploits, uh, but in the, in the time um, we've been running it at my school, Touchwood, five years, we haven't had any uh, non intrusions or students changing grades or anything like that. On the complete other end of the spectrum, what got my attention is when my children enrolled and I started getting a report, you know, that school home connection. Yep. Every Friday there was an auto report for all the tasks they had done and what their next when the next tasks were due. It was just in my email box waiting on me. Yep. And I, as a parent, because I saw Campbell's name there a moment ago, his forty eight hours is pending. Yep. You know, there you go. So, but I already know that day after tomorrow, I'm going to get another email generated by the data that's going into this database. Yep. And I just found that so powerful. Um, and, and it was so easy for me to use as a parent, new to, to give it. Yep. 
and then hopefully you work out from there that you can log in. You get a welcome letter as well introducing you to the system so you can log in. The other thing with that email is that there's a link at the bottom um, that lets Brian say that he's received the email and has read it without having to log into the system. So what, our, what we ask our parents to do, just like they used to sign the physical diary, now they click the link and the form tutor has a view that shows who has and hasn't clicked the link. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks for, That's good. for reminding me of that. Um, and there are some other backgrounds that you can set up to run. So that one um, runs on a Friday afternoon. There are some other processes that you can run. So on the server side, you might request a daily incomplete attendance email. So I get this email and then it automatically gets forwarded on to some vice principals at school. It tells me which form groups haven't taken attendance at 8.25, so we can chase them. Uh, there's a feature to get behavior letters, although I notice that's misspelled, which isn't so good. That. Um, behavior letters go out. So in the system, there's a behavior management section where teachers can individually record positive and negative behavior. There are some thresholds that you can set, like when a student gets to five behavior records, it will automatically send out a, an email letter to the parents and just say, you are being alerted that this is the case. And then there's a second letter, and a, th a second level, and a third level. Um, library, you can send overdue notifications, so we have those go out first thing on a Monday morning. So your inbox um, gets hit with some emails telling you that you've got things overdue, and those notifications also show up here. So I can see I have five pending notifications of various kinds. Um, the plan or weekly summary is what Brian was talking about. And this process just runs every night at our school and just checks for any problems with people's enrollment status, like all the kids in the family have left but the parents' accounts are still alive. It just goes through and cleans that up um, just to try and get rid of any orphan accounts. Let me just take a screenshot of that so I can um, fix that misspelling later. It changes the way that, uh, that you operate at home as a parent because it wasn't two weeks. It was two Fridays that, that went by and my children knew they couldn't wait till Sunday night to start doing their work. <laughs> yeah. Because I knew on Friday. Yeah. That's and, it. And now if I miss a Friday and I don't click your link to let you know I've looked at it, they know <laughs> or they suspect that I may have. So they're in there doing their stuff. Yeah. So if we go back to the parent <coughs> interface, hopefully you see other aspects of like that, like knowing what your child has studied on a given day. Um, like having access to their recent grades and academic comments, like being able to see where, where they are at a particular time, for example. For our older students, they enroll in their own activities, so the parents can see what they've enrolled for. For our younger students, the parents enroll on behalf of the students, like for, for our primary students. Uh, and that, you know, I actually don't get much feedback from parents anymore because they're, they're just accustomed to the system. <laughs> But in the first few years, we just got a lot of feedback from parents saying how wonderful it was to have this kind of access to the school lives, especially for secondary kids who come home and say, ah, you know, what did you do today? <laughs> uh, just, just to be able to see what's going on, know what's going on. So a couple of questions from the teacher perspective. Do all teachers place their lesson plans on the system? It's optional. Um, our, our rule is that if you assign homework, you have to have a lesson plan, so there's a place for the homework to be stored. Uh, but beyond that, it's optional. There's probably, uh, depending on the, on the day and the weeks, probably between 70 and 80% of lessons going into the system. Other planning happens in Google Docs and on the server. Um, you know, the, there are certain benefits, I believe, to having all of the lessons in one place, but we've just taken a, a more open approach. But most, most teachers, when, the, when we first built the system, it didn't do very much, and a lot of teachers were sort of a bit cold about it in that, well, oh, it doesn't really help me that much. But there were a few teachers that really got on board and gave us a lot of very rapid feedback. And uh, literally, you know, I'd take the taxi into work with one of my colleagues and he'd make a suggestion, and then I'd go and deliver it to him during period two and say, yeah, now it does that. Um, right. So teachers got on board very quickly in the first, say, six months, and that led to quite an uptake in terms of using the planner. Um, how you would 
get people on side in this school um, and whether that would be your aim to get people using the plan. Good, uh, interesting discussion. Okay. And then when kids submit, your your ICT technology teacher, so presumably most of the stuff is is uh, electronic anyway. Yeah. Do other do other subject areas insist that when kids hand in work, it's all electronic, or are kids still turning in hard copy? There's there's quite a variety, uh, and one of the settings when I assign the homework. The, the assignment of the homework and the, the collection of homework are two separate options, right. so I can do one without the other. Um, let me just go back and show you what that, what that looks like. And the other alternative is that when I say that I'm accepting homework, I can say that the digital submission is optional in which case it's not tracking late and incomplete and things like that. So I may say to my students, you can hand it in on paper or you can hand it in uh, digitally. It's up to you and the system will, will deal with that. Yeah. So if I edit that lesson. Of course, I picked Campbell's class completely by accident. But there you go. <laughs> there you go. So scrolling down in in the planning. So the first part of this is the actual assignment of the homework. Yes, there is homework. This is when it's due. This is the details of the homework. And then further down, there's a separate section. Do I want to select submission? Yes, I do want online submission. Is it optional or compulsory? Can students opt to submit in, in other ways? Um, and then with the mark book, I could choose to link my lesson, I can choose to link that submission into the mark book so that I can mark the work and I can see the work and mark the work in one place. Uh, but of course I can use the mark book just with the paper submissions beside me and just put my, my comments in there. So are the kids building e-portfolios of work based um, on this kind of stuff? They, I mean, they, they, in a sense they build up a portfolio of the submitted work, but it's yeah. never presented as a portfolio. Right. We have a WordPress based portfolio system. Um, not as lively as I would like, but it's a battle for another day. So. Right. And then when, you, when it's submitted electronically, digitally, whatever, and you say you can mark it there, yep. does, it, does it have things like drop down menu comments and banks and those kinds of things, bank statement banks and what have you? The, do, you know, do you know what I mean? No, yeah, 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 yeah I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, no, it doesn't have that built in. When you when you view the work, you view it in whatever format it was submitted. So if it's like a Word document, you'll open it in Word and yeah. you can use the Word annotation right. tools right. and then upload it as a response. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have like a, um, a Turnitin style marking interface. What about if they submitted, say, a YouTube clip or, or a YouTube link, sorry? Yeah or a, a piece of video, what, what would be the options there in terms of comments? So when I, when I set the homework, I can choose whether they can submit a link or a file, yeah. or whether they get a choice between link or file. Mm -hmm. So if it was a video project, I might say link or file. If it was a small video, I think ASO is set to accept up to 64 megabytes. Um, so they could submit that as a file. Otherwise, if it was larger, they would submit it as a link. Yeah. Um, and then I would comment on that in the mark book. So for the mark book, I'll just go into my local installation and show you what the mark book looks like. So these are all fictional students with fictional grades. Here are three different columns for three different pieces of work. Right. When I set up a column, I have a choice on what information to include in that column. So I can turn attainment on or off. Yeah. So I can say that I'm not actually going to mark on attainment. I can do the same for effort. Yeah. And then with attainment, I can choose what scale to mark on. I can choose to give a percentage weighting or a numeric weighting to that scale. This is new, and you didn't see this last time. No. Um, which will then sum up all of the columns and give me a total. If you're into numbers, yeah, um, I can choose a rubric which will be predefined. Here, I only have one rubric to choose from. Uh, let me just turn on a couple of these things. Um, within effort, I can choose again from a scale 
and a rubric, yeah. and I can choose whether to have a comment and an uploaded file response. So with all those things turned on, when I enter data into that column, and I'll use this as an example because, uh, no, no way. I'll use this as an example. So here I see the student. If they submitted the work, it would appear in a column here, and I can click on it and open up the work directly there. Um, I can choose my grade. I can mark my rubric. I can choose my effort grade, and I can write a comment, and then I can choose a file here that I'm going to upload. Does that go to the student? In the setup page, um, by default, it's set to be viewable to students and parents, right. but teachers individually can turn can that turn off. Yeah. There's also a go live date. Um, it, even if it's set to yes for students and parents, they won't see it until that live date has been met. And the aim there is that if you have an incomplete grade book, like your, the marking is in process, they don't see the results until you've you finished everything. How are you using Gibbon in conjunction with uh, Google Apps for Education? We don't have any direct integration. Um, I've been talking with a couple of my Gibbon buddies in other schools about maybe integrating something on the home page, like my most recent uh, Google Drive documents or something like that. Right. But there isn't any formal integration at the moment. Um, they're integrated in the sense that a lot of the work that gets submitted is produced at our school using Google Apps. Um, one method of integration, if I can find the lesson very quickly, and this will test my organizational skills. <laughs> Let's see how well this really works. So in year seven at the moment, my students are studying something called Teacher Teacher, um, which I should pitch to you whilst I'm here. I will, I will give you, I'll show you the poster before I go. In Teacher Teacher, students plan a presentation to uh, give at a conference where teachers come to learn about technology. So the teachers sit down and, and become the students, and the students stand up and act as the teachers. This is happening next Wednesday at KG5, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's free. I'll give you the link to sign up. As part of Teacher Teacher, they have seven lessons, which you can see here, where they plan what they're going to do. And in one of these lessons, I believe it's this one, there is a Google form that I've embedded I've built it in Google, I've taken the HTML embed code and I've embedded it in the lesson so the students can populate my Google form in the lesson. So I could use that to do a quiz. So close. It gives the lesson before. There you go. So here's submit group details. The form loads up. The students submit the form telling me about their group. They press submit and then I get it all in this spreadsheet. So in that sense, you can integrate any embeddable HTML object like a YouTube video or a form or um, other, a range of other objects. Got one more question. Yep. Um, <clears throat> you've answered some of them already because we've seen it allows some flexibility in mm -hmm. the way you uh, the assessments and stuff like that. Uh, more on a general thing, when you, because you, obviously you've developed this for yep. uh, some ESF and this school. Uh, how flexible is it to, I mean, it, maybe we don't rely on, uh, or we, we have a different way of doing things. Yep. Uh, how is it, is it to um, adapt? Uh, is it we have to program something or have you already done some optional parameters or something that because that's a big thing when yeah. you start to sure. uh, propagate to other school you see that they're all functioning differently so yeah. uh, so one of the lessons i worked at Chartim college yeah. i learned at Chartim college was that every school is different yeah. and, that, <laughs> and that every day every individual school changes right so i built it and then the next day they asked me to change it and the next day they asked me to change it so Given the name comes because Gibbons are really flexible animals, so one of the initial aims was a flexible system. And I didn't want to have to recode things. So in the admin section here, um, there are over 150 different parameters that control the way the system works. One of the most fundamental um, 
ways that the flexibility is built in is that there's a system of um, modules, plug-in modules, like you might see in WordPress or Firefox. Okay. Each module offers uh, a set of actions that can be performed, and those actions can be enabled or disabled for different roles within the system. So if I show you what that page looks like, um, if I go into manage permissions, so the system comes with five inbuilt roles, teaching staff, support staff, parent, student, and admin, which are these ones over here. Mm -hmm. On the right side, you can see different roles that have been added in my school, such as finance, finance director, higher education. Here we see the modules, which correspond to the entries that you would see up here, the activities, and here are the actions for that module. So you can flexibly customize the the available functionality for different groups of people. Um, and then beyond that, there are um, a wide range of other options. So to give you one example, uh, when we looked at the mark book, there were two uh, different ways to grade. There was attainment and there was effort. Those terms could be changed for the whole school in the mark book setting. So you can see at my school, we actually call effort approaches to learning. So if I looked at my school's mark book, the column wouldn't be called effort, it would be called approaches to learning. Um, similarly, the, the different types of mark book columns that you might have is customizable in this uh, CSV list. Um, and the schools that have come on board already have, have asked for certain customizations to make things more flexible, and that's something that, you know, as much as we try to think about that ahead of time, there are always things you have to pull on. But, <laughs> Generally, a lot of schools, the feedback seems to be, hey, it, it does what we want, we can, we can mold it to our needs. How many schools have you got on board? Um, at the moment, it's looking like around 20 in production worldwide. I think last time I was here, I said 10. Yeah. It's hard to discern the exact number. Um, we've just had, we've also okay. come on board just in the last few weeks, um, and I'm getting more evidence from the forums that there are schools yeah. in other countries. Is it just this region? No. Um, no, it's, it's starting to grow in India and Africa, just because of the, the cost, right? yeah. just being able to get a free system. It's also quite light in terms of server resources, um, so you can run it on all the hardware. Um, next year I'm hoping to get some students shipping given to developing countries on Raspberry Pis, which are tiny computers. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll see. The plan is to do like a, a crowdfunding yeah sort of uh, social business in school where we okay. where we build the systems and then we yeah. try and raise money to ship them to schools. So we'll see if that works. But yeah, the aim is that you could run it on a Raspberry Pi as long as you didn't have, you know, a thousand users hitting you at the same time. Yeah. Your library catalog collection on there? Yep. Is an HTML push out for your collection so it can be searched from home? Um, yeah, so parents and students have access to the library interface. No, we don't, we don't go into Ross, just want to ask a oh, question. Okay. What about CAS, Manage Back? Could it take place in that? Um, there is a IB diploma module that does CAS. It doesn't do some of the other things that Manage Back does. Um, I've been talking about upgrading it for a while, but my school uses Manage Back, so I haven't had much incentive. This is our library interface, so you can see some best-selling lists up at the top. And sorry, some of the images are still loading, uh, but you see a visual collection and you can expand these and see more details about the various books. Um, and then the, the librarian signs them out and we track loans. And we also use this for IT loans, so like when you loan out a dongle, you can record it in the system, you can record all your assets, who's got them, when they need to be replaced, how much they cost, things like that. Multi-language? Yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, now, the quality of the French translation I can't speak to. Um, I will sign out here and I will sign back in and choose French. This was, the translation was done by a uh, French speaking guy from Senegal, perhaps, somewhere in Africa. Um, and I speak no French and I said, well, it looks like French, so thank you very much. So there we have the, the interface translated into French. Obviously, it doesn't translate um, the content, like the lesson plans, but the, the strings are all there. Um, and 
The Cantonese translation here was actually done by two students of mine as part of a project. Um, so if I was to go in, in, in local Chinese, we can see that. So there'd be a great opportunity for you to run as a student project the process of improving the translation, checking the French, does it make sense, does it fit the content, context, and have kids improve it. How about mother tongue collections in your library? Do you accept that thing? Um, there's no specific categories for that, but it supports, the system supports uh, a wide range of text types. So you can have Chinese, Japanese, Arabic text in the database.